Hello, and welcome to the Code Rage 9 C Builder keynote. I'm JT, the Senior Director of Application Developer Products, and I hope you've been enjoying the first few sessions here in the C track of Code Rage 9. So, most of you know me by now. I'm JT, I'm the Director uh, at Embarcadero Technologies. I'm responsible for all the developer product management and product marketing. So, C Builder, Delphi, Red Studio, App Method, Interbase. These are all the tools and products that my team is responsible for. Probably more important for you is that I am a C++ developer at heart. I've been developing in C++ as far back as I can remember and continue to develop in C++ regularly. Here's some of my contact information. You can reach me jtnabarcadero.com for email. Uh, my Twitter handle is at firemonkeypm and this is my very lengthy URL to my blog on the community. So during this keynote session, we're going to talk a little bit about where C++ Builder is today. I'm going to talk about some key features of XC7 and break it up basically around VCL uh, in Windows development, uh, the language in RTL, FireMonkey in mobile, a new product offering called uh, EMS or Enterprise Mobility Services, and on the IDE as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about future product directions. So if you have any questions as we go through this, we'll, we'll try to handle them at the end, but feel free to um, add those questions into the question log as we go along. So where is C++ Builder today? Well, C++ Builder is everywhere. Uh, C++ is everywhere. These products and languages are being used to power today's applications that run on desktop, that run on servers, that run in the cloud, that run on gadgets such as smartwatches. Uh, and or wearables uh, and other type of uh, Internet of Things uh, gadgets. So C++ Builder has really come a long way in the last several years with uh, the support for more than just Windows development. Of course, you can continue to develop VCL applications with C++ Builder and build, uh, uh, as of a few versions ago, 64-bit Windows VCL applications. But you can also take those applications and extend them into mobile for iOS and Android and for uh, Windows and Mac using FireMonkey using our multi-platform uh, features and manage a single C++ code base across all these applications and all these uh, all these platforms. So C++ Builder has really come a long way um, and this is just a small example of the kinds of things that it can target and deliver on uh, here in 2014. C++ Builder is really it's a path forward it's not only your path to mobile development in that you can take existing code with you and you can manage a single code base across all these platforms, but you have more than just a user interface framework. A lot like the VCL is more than just a user interface framework. You can build multi-platform applications that deliver live data, uh, that uh, support modern architectures like cloud, backend as a service, mobile enterprise application platforms using all standard REST. So you can build very full-featured, very connected applications in C++ Builder. And C++ Builder is really a key to extending your existing Windows, app, uh, Windows VCL applications. Um, so, uh, for example, we'll talk about a feature called App Tethering, which we introduced last version and extended in this version to include Bluetooth. These are ways that you can take existing apps and have them talk now to mobile applications or talk to gadgets or, or wearables. So there's really type integration now between the desktop and mobile and these Internet of Things. So at a glance, XC7 is really about extending your, your VCL application because this device revolution is continuing, taking your existing apps and expanding and expanding them with multi-device, connecting apps to one another, connecting to gadgets, working with wearables. So connecting with and embracing these technologies using features such as app tethering with Bluetooth. A couple other new features we've added are is a parallel programming library which makes it really easy to build in using uh, uh, VCL or FireMonkey type conventions uh, into your code uh, using the, the same shared RTL between VCL and uh, FireMonkey to build parallel programs. And in this last release a new middle tier solution um, or middleware called Enterprise uh, Mobility Services. 
But all in all, we've been really putting a lot of effort over the last few versions to ensure we're delivering the best quality ever. Um, and in this release, we believe we've delivered the best C++ builder so far. So let's talk a little bit about VCL and Windows development specifically first. So these features are largely shared across um, VCL and FireMonkey. And of course, that means they support Windows. So one of those that we'll be talking about is the Parallel Programming Library. This is, again, ways to uh, create parallel threads uh, that can take advantage of multi-core systems. And so there's a behind the, pic, the, uh, behind the scenes, there's a thread pool that's creating and managing multiple threads for you to allow these, uh, these problem sets that you put into the parallel programming library to run uh, largely in parallel and to use as much of the uh, available CPU power across all the CPUs as possible. VCL specifically, we've added uh, jump list and taskbar components. These are pretty important for modernizing your application to make them look like modern Windows 7 or mod modern uh, Windows 8.1 applications. We've added Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE support. And this is, again, at the lower level where it's shared across uh, not just VCL but also FireMonkey and not just on Windows but these other platforms as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about what you can do with that here in, in a few minutes. But part of that is this mobile and desktop concept of app tethering the ability to connect applications to one another through very easy to use components. Um, and this comes in really handy when you're thinking about extending existing Windows applications. So today your Windows applications are running fine. They may have, uh, your VCL apps may have millions of lines of code in them, but there are certain features that just make sense on mobile as a way to extend your application uh, to add more value to your existing application or to give your users more choices or more flexibility. Uh, but leverage that existing source code, those existing applications that you've built. And uh, another one we're going to talk about is FireDAC. Uh, FireDAC is a new data access library that's uh, very high performance, uh, delivers uh, great coverage of all the major databases in a universal data access uh, way, but also does some very uh, database specific types of features. And IB Lite. IB Lite is a free version of Interbase that's meant to be embedded with your application running not only on mobile, Android and iOS, but also available for Windows and desktop. So this is a great time to think about replacing any flat file databases you might be working with or uh, textual persistence formats like XML or JSON, for example, with a full embedded database in Ivy Lite. So the Parallel Programming Library has a couple of key features. Um, basically, you'll find these in System.Threading Unit. Uh, the first is a, a parallel for loop. So this is one way that you can just replace existing for loops um, and uh, allow the, uh, the parallel library to take any actions that happen inside that for loop and run them basically in parallel for you. Uh, you can also use uh, T-Task to schedule tasks. Uh, the way you use it in C++ is as a, as a static class. So uh, T-Task colon colon run, for example. I will set that up as well as a features uh, uh, feature which allows you to set up a, a features call uh, with the callback that will be uh, provided uh, by you to be called back by the feature when the asynchronous call is completed. Some VCL specific components. So in XE6 we started adding more features around taskbars um, and some of the features that people have been expecting uh, inside the taskbar in modern applications. So for example adding a menu to your taskbar, but doing more than that, also being able to provide custom previews, um, preview frames, the ability to, like for example, if there's a uh, media file, you can play it using the embedded controls that are available to you uh, through these taskbar uh, buttons. We've also now added in XC7 jump list components. So these are ways to uh, provide categories around menu items um, and to be able to, uh, to launch those uh, from your menu. So these are all modern menuing features that have been introduced largely in Windows 7 um, and to some extent are still used in Windows 8.1 in the uh, windowed mode. Bluetooth on Windows is one of the more exciting uh, deliveries in XC7. Uh, not just Bluetooth but also what you may have heard is Smart Bluetooth or Bluetooth LE. Uh, this is um, the ability to connect with devices and gadgets through Bluetooth. Uh, 
Bluetooth LE is something that is available in Windows 8, actually it requires Windows 8.1 and allows you to connect to these little devices, these little smart devices uh, such as heart rate monitors or um, blood pressure monitors or these these uh, Bluetooth uh, devices that use a, a standard uh, gap profile. So a lot of the M Health or, or um, you know a lot of these M Health wearables that we, I just shared with you are connectable through the Bluetooth LE component as well as standard Bluetooth. And standard Bluetooth even is able to integrate app tethering. So app tethering, again, is that concept of being able to drop a component in one app and a component in another, the same component, being able to find them uh, either on the local uh, network or through a Bluetooth connection and be able to then send uh, data back and forth to one another or to call routines uh, functions, procedures that you defined as being accessible to another app um, from a remote application. So really useful in extending your application from Windows out to mobile and beyond. Basically the way it works is one way to think about it is you can remote control your VCL apps for mobile. So let's say you had a media player that you've written in VCL. You can write a FireMonkey app, drop this control in there. On the Windows side, which uh, your VCL app may already have been written, drop uh, a component in there, set up some available uh, procedures uh, or actions that can be um, available to a another application, and then that becomes discoverable once it's available either through a Bluetooth uh, pairing or um, a Wi-Fi or you know local internet connection. The other application can find it, it can connect to it, and start making those calls back and forth. So there's no real configuration required other than you are either uh, p uh, have a paired device or you're on the same, uh, same local network. So in addition to exchanging data between applications, that remote controlling is where it's a, a very powerful concept uh, to extend your existing applications. So again, the way it works is just simple communication components that live on each side. Um, the, the app, and these go both ways, but the app that's going to be uh, controlled just makes some actions available or says I can accept this type of uh, input. The other app then uh, through the action of connecting up to it can uh, find out which actions are available and then add them into its application to be able to call those actions remotely. So again a couple ideas really think about companion types of apps uh, like maybe you're, you're scanning a barcode um, with your camera uh, on your mobile phone, you can easily send that over to your desktop app as a picture or as a string after you've uh, converted it. Um, you can use, uh, uh, you know, this remote control concept. Uh, I've heard some really great use cases coming out uh, from uh, from our actual customers uh, who who are really taking this to extend existing applications and add add some really unique features um, to their existing applications. On the RTL side, um, we've added some additional support into, um, uh, into XML uh, by supporting Omni XML. This works in mobile, uh, has a new namespace, um, uh, or it supports XML namespaces, I should say. Um, and you can su tell it which XML library you want to use, um, you know, based on each, uh, on each project. So these are found in the, um, and also, I should say, we added a new system.net encoding for web-related encoding and decoding, including Base64. Uh, HTML and URL encoding. On the database access side, XE7 uh, continues to deliver uh, the best in FireDAC for local and client server, uh, server connectivity. Um, FireDAC is a universal database access layer, but very high performance as well as having uh, lots of uh, database specific features. Um, and then another really great one is uh, availability of IB Lite now for all platforms. So we initially released it just for mobile, Android and iOS, and we've extended it here in XE7 to include the Windows and Mac platforms as well. So now you can have a common embedded database across all the supported platforms. One thing to note is that the BDE is no longer delivered in the products in XE7, but it is available as a separate download. But speaking of the BDE, the combination of FireDAC and IBLite really give you a modern and straightforward migration off of BDE. FireDAC supports a BDE-like programming model 
and IB Lite can easily replace your flat file databases like uh, Paradox files or DBase files or whatever it is that you're using as a local data store. So if you're on BDE today, take a good look at FireDAC and IB Lite together. The data set itself uh, continues to evolve, so um, added in XC6 for uh, dynamic field uh, creations. Um, you can uh, also uh, merge persistent fields with dynamic fields. Uh, so, for example, um, calculated fields with, uh, without other persistent fields, and also dynamic queries uh, with some persistent fields, and new field options properties as well. So FireDAC, again, this is really the data access cornerstone. It's high performance. It's easy to use. Uh, if, again, if you're using a BDE type model, then you'll find it very straightforward. If you're using DB Express type model, common API approach as well. And it's really about enterprise database connectivity. So whether that's local uh, to uh, a local database or client server or beyond, uh, FireDAC solves all these problems. And it supports these multiple target platforms. Uh, so, you know, I like to think about it as, as um, you know, being fun again. Uh, FireDAC is uh, kind of brings the magic of uh, of Delphi and C++ Builder alive, where you're connecting data into your application very easily. The combination of your data access to your database, your uh, connection into uh, data aware controls and quotes, because in FireMonkey, their data uh, controls aren't exactly data aware. You use a binding uh, to get those in there. So more of a uh, model view, view model type of approach. But um, you know, absolutely, this is the secret sauce of this of these tools, and it's uh, live and well and uh, very uh, invigorating uh, to see this technology just continue to evolve beyond the desktop and into mobile and beyond. Some new features in FireDAC. Uh, database features in general in XC7, so true blob streaming, uh, including SQL Server file stream. Uh, we've done uh, some FD batch move components, so this is migrating data and metadata between databases from different vendors. Um, and we also included some scripts for helping you migrate from BDE. You can find that in the refined uh, script uh, availability. So let's take some time to talk about the multi-device side and FireMonkey in particular. Lots of new features here in XC7 for developing mobile applications, particularly those that have to support multiple form factors. So we've int introduced a brand new technology called Fire UI. It's a combination of a designer uh, and some components as well as uh, libraries that allow you to build common user interfaces across multiple form factors and then optimize them for specific form factors if you need to. We've done some mobile and desktop extensions as well. We've added enterprise mobility services, which can connect with any front end, and for that matter, any language that wants to talk to it through standard REST, Bluetooth and app tethering, and some of these uh, language and RTL features that we talked about earlier uh, that are shared with the VCL. So really what's driving this is that mobile is everywhere, and we're just seeing more and more form factors that developers have to deal with. Initially, when we did um, FireMonkey, the goal was, or is today, to be able to let you manage one common source code project across all these different types of operating systems. And that works really well. But it was still challenging to, write, to try to support multiple form factors, even just the differences between a phone in, in portrait mode and a tablet in landscape mode. So we focused on how do we help developers be more productive in this multi-device form factor um, world that we live in as well. And that's really the genesis of Fire UI. So it's a flexible design. Uh, the multi-device designer allows you to manage a common user interface through a master form. This is where you share all your components and your event logic. Um, at the end of the day, you really just have one class that is supported across all these different form factors. But it also knows how to adapt to the specific form factor. So for example, we provide a component called Team Multiview. Team Multiview uh, is, knows, using what you see over here as, as the behavior services, what platform it's running on. And also, uh, more information about the form factor. So a couple of simple of examples are uh, tabbed control applications. In Android, tabbed apps live across, or the tabs I should say, live across the top of the form. In iOS, they live across the bottom. They do the exact same thing, but they're presented differently uh, based on the platform. 
So these components know where to place themselves. They, and it's all the same code that you interact with, but is rendered differently depending on the platform that it's running on. Another example would be something like Master Detail, where you're managing a list of items that when you click on them can provide more detail. If you're in a phone in portrait mode, you want that master list out of the way. You basically want to look at the detail. But then you, when you want to see the list, you need to have a way to access it. So the general UI paradigms are to either have a menu that can pop up or to have a drawer that can be slid out. Now this drawer that can be slid out is basically two windows. One is the master, uh, which is in the drawer, and the, and the detail, which is in the page. If you flip this thing sideways on a tablet in landscape mode, you have more real estate to work with. So the component knows I should dock myself uh, the menu, the master part, into the left and present the detail in the right. And therefore you have the right expected user experience based on that platform. You can also call into these behavior services uh, to uh, make more informed decisions about how you want to lay out your application. But at the end of the day what I want you to remember about uh, Fire UI is it gives you a common way to to develop a, a UI across all these form factors with the ability then to optimize it for specific form factors as needed. You don't always have to, but you can. And there's a, a technology behind the scenes that allows you to track these changes. So the master basically contains all the components. It contains all the event logic. Uh, it's a common class that all of your supported form factors are going to support. When you create a view, so let's say you want to create one for an Android 7 inch tablet and one for a 4 inch tablet, well, they're going to lay out according to the master initially, but you can then modify them inside that view. You can move the button around, you can change its text, um, you could add more controls, and the differences are managed in a separate FMX file. So uh, when the class is created, it first loads up the master. Uh, FMX file reads in or streams in I should say all the properties to construct part of the class and then it looks to see if it needs to construct a specific view if one is available to it if there is it reads a, basically a delta file of the differences between the master and what was specified in the view it streams in those addition that additional information or difference to information and finishes construction of the class so now you have a single class, shared source code, shared event logic across all these devices, but again the ability to provide a specific user interface depending on the form factor that you're targeting. The multi-view component again, this is a, a control that it uh, knows how to properly d place itself or render itself depending on what the platform either uh, expects or what the developer would prefer to do based on the form factor. So I use the example of the phone in uh, portrait mode using a drawer type of uh, approach or uh, a tablet in landscape mode using a docked type of approach or a popover is another example. So this is an example of a, a, a component that can use these behavior services to figure out where is, where is the best place for it or the best mechanism by which it should display itself. Again, you can set this kind of stuff up too or talk to the behavior services yourself or just tell the, the component, just do what the platform expects me to. And therefore, the framework will, will make the request of the platform through the behavior services to find out what it can do and it will properly display that component. Another interesting feature that we've added uh, starting in XC7 is now we're able to render controls on a per control basis. So the granularity of whether the platform draws the control or FireMonkey draws the control can be done and on each single component. So we've started adding into forms uh, in this version. Some controls are drawn completely by the platform. Other controls are drawn by, by FireMonkey. So we're injecting more and more uh, quote native platform controls uh, into FireMonkey and just asking the OS to uh, display that for us or to draw it for us um, where that's required. And then finally behavior services again this is a developer accessible API. The framework of course uses it all over the place. It's what informs for example the team multi-view component. But it provides all sorts of details about the device, the operating system, and the form factor that the app is running on. This is really what drives the features of Fire UI. A couple more things we've done in FireMonkey in XC7. We uh, support uh, multi-monitor support in the desktop. 
uh, in this release we've done a bunch of work in multi-touch uh, we've added project manager support to in Android in particular to add Java libraries to an app uh, with a tool also to convert those to um, an object Pascal uh, format which then of course you can generate a C++ header to talk to it now of course with C++ in Android you can always just talk to the native SDK or or uh, library directly as well uh, so uh, you have the tools that you need to generate your import libraries for example uh, to talk to uh, those native uh, DLLs and, and SOs. Uh, we've added support for the immersive mode in Android. This is basically the full screen as well as splash screen support so that your apps can uh, pop up a splash screen before they load. And then native uh, platform presentations of certain controls including T-Edit on iOS. And XC7, one of the things that we've really put a lot of attention on is this burgeoning world uh, that's colloquially known as the Internet of Things, but we, we know them as gadgets and wearables and little devices that people are able to connect to their mobile phones or to other types of applications to extend the user experience, uh, whether that's a smartwatch or a pair of glasses or um, these little devices that can, you know, little sensors basically that can pick up a bunch of my biometric information by living on your person and pairing with a app that can read that information all these are available to you now in XC7 with the blue embedded Bluetooth support with the support for Bluetooth LE you can now integrate and expand your application into the Internet of Things by uh, building out applications that can take advantage of these new user experience elements in delivering new types of solutions so really what's behind it from a technology perspective is two things Bluetooth LE because most of these small devices are using the LT format I'm sorry LE format and app tethering and app tethering uh, is that we talked quite a bit about it previously that ability to connect applications to one another through simple components over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, mobile to desktop mobile to mobile desktop to desktop it's up to you how you really want to connect these things but the technology is there to make it happen and on the LE side being able to connect to all these little devices which uh, requires Windows 8.1 by the way so interacting with these gadgets really can be done one of four key ways there's a, a talk being done by uh, Brian uh, in both the C++ and Object Pascal tracks about these types of uh, uh, connections um, whether it's through Bluetooth LE or standard Bluetooth which means you can use app tethering um, REST over HTTP, so a lot of these little gadgets uh, present web servers that have a REST uh, APIs that you can talk to, or they provide custom SDKs um, and, uh, and APIs that you can talk to, and most of these are written in C or uh, pretty straightforward C++ as well. Um, and lastly, you can also, of course, build apps that run on gadgets that support a full-fledged operating system like Android, for example. So this is how you mostly will be interacting with gadgets. Actually, these are about the main ways you will, um, and we got it all covered here in XC7. On the mobile data side, there's lots of ways to connect with information as well, whether that's in the cloud. So looking at uh, back-end business service providers like Azure or uh, AWS, where you're building the services on a platform, talking to pretty much any REST server out there with the REST client library. Um, so this is a very straightforward approach uh, to uh, call into uh, asynchronous uh, REST calls. And this also continues to support SOAP as well. Uh, strict, specifically backend as a service. So uh, services or service providers like Parse and Kinvey and App42, uh, we built components that allow you to do common things across all of them like user management or um, authentication, for example, or, or file storage. And then, of course, uh, building your own middleware using uh, SDK like DataSnap. But in XC7, we're introducing a new uh, mobile enterprise application platform uh, solution called Enterprise Mobility Services. And I'll be doing an uh, introductory uh, talk about EMS uh, later today. But EMS is basically a turnkey middleware server. It comes full of services that you can use right out of the box, including user management and authentication being able to build loadable modules to create custom APIs over REST that other developers are going to use enterprise SQL database access with all the major database drivers supported using FireDAC on the back end 
including embedded and server-side SQL data storage uh, through Interbase to Go and uh, Interbase server licenses. And then lastly, and definitely not least, because this is becoming more and more important, being able to do analytics. And so you have a way to access these analytics through a web console to understand uh, how your services that you've exposed are being used um, and which APIs are being called. So at a high level, EMS is a middleware solution. It's a turnkey middleware server. It's very easy to build something with all these services and just deploy it onto your web server in order to take advantage of all these features. So EMS server uses a plugin uh, package model. Um, it basically runs an IIS today. And you build modules that will be uh, loaded into uh, EMS and then loaded into uh, the web server that will drive it. The web server is needed to expose these features uh, via REST. So this REST interfaces get exposed out to EMS clients through REST APIs or through our backend as a, as a service uh, components. And you get Interbase to Go licenses included in this feature. So now you have an embedded data store that's part of the solution. On the server side, EMS then can use FireDAC to talk to any major database that you need to. So this is how you get that and manage that, uh, that critical um, information that's living behind the firewall in these SQL databases. And EMS provides a nice framework, um, much like uh, DataSnap, in being able to query databases and move this information down to the client and back and forth. And then lastly, uh, the ability to connect into any uh, backend as a service provider uh, using the uh, backend as a service components. Lastly, the Interbase server license is included as well, and it's actually an Interbase server is what's driving the EMS information as well. So if you compare this to DataSnap, just to help you understand a little bit more how what it does for you, you can think of DataSnap as like an SDK, it's a do-it-yourself solution. Uh, you can build these features yourself or these services, but of course you then need to build them yourself and write them yourself. EMS, on the other hand, is turnkey. It means it's ready to use outside of the box. All these services are just provided. When uh, you build your own server, including uh, REST and HTTP support on DataSnap, uh, the way it works in EMS is you just create server extensions, and this exposes REST APIs and those databases uh, out through a REST API. So what this means is that EMS is a fully stateless uh, solution. There's no sessions going on, which also makes it extremely scalable. In DataSnap, you have various levels of session management, but generally you have to, sessions are part of how DataSnap works. So that's a big difference, the stateless, uh, sessionless approach versus uh, some session management that's in DataSnap. And the, the argument for stateless and sessionless is that it's much more scalable. You're just going in and making the calls when you need them. You don't need to manage that state. Um, and it's also very much more robust in that regard as well. EMS includes user management. Uh, the API call analytics and the and the analytics console, data snap. These are all things that you would write using the uh, the SDK available to you. And um, lastly, uh, and these this is both similar. Both EMS and data snap are solutions that you host yourself. Um, one difference here, though, is that data snap is self-hosted, free to deploy, only in the enterprise SKU, whereas EMS is available also in the uh, client server pack of professional. So this is self-hosted as well, but it's a uh, pay-per-user and includes Interbase server and Interbase to go licenses. So we talked a little bit about previously with some of the fe VCL features such as parallel programming library and the database and FireDAC extensions. Uh, these are shared um, with FireMonkey. These are in the RTL level. So these are features that you can use for pure Windows development, but also um, uh, multi-device. On the IDE side, we've introduced this new multi-device designer uh, for Fire UI. We've added some cool features around guided tours, so this is a way to create interactive tutorials and learn more about these features, and you'll, you'll find that right there on the start page when you go in. You can walk through your first tutorial that way. Updated version control support, um, including SVN support, as well as some new Git support as well. So if you're using the Git repository, you can now manage those uh, through the IDE. And then an ongoing initiative here is to continuously improve quality and performance and stability. Um, we believe that 
since we've been doing this for many versions with a concerted effort, that the quality is just getting better and better. So the XC7 really represents the best development experience that you can get. Um, and it's not just about, uh, you know, things not crashing. It's also about runtime performance um, and general quality. Uh, internally, we've fixed over 2,000 bugs, and, but that includes over 300 externally reported bugs as well. So make sure you get your bugs into the system um, if it's something that's uh, uh, causing issues for you that we can help uh, support. And one of the other um, areas that we've uh, added support for uh, getting around is this out of IDE compilation, uh, out of memory um, uh, issues. You can do out of IDE compilation now for large projects. So you can just hit a switch and the tool chains, et cetera, will load in a separate process. They won't use the same process uh, space or memory as the IDE. And this will help you really in those much larger projects and trying to get those built in the, and uh, out to market. So let's talk a little bit about future directions. Um, first of all, we're continuing to uh, build uh, some updates for XC7. There's a security hotfix that's out there already, a uh, simulator, simulator uh, hotfix. Um, we have a, a linker that's out there to support the new uh, iOS 8 App Store submission uh, process. Um, and then we also have um, uh, the free bonus pack downloads and a new turbo pack that's available as well. This is a collection of libraries uh, for, of older VCL controls like Turbo Power Async, for example, that you can get access to and start using in your applications if you've been depending on those over the years. And so that update one is coming soon. From a strategic perspective, some of the future directions that we're focusing on is, is Windows 10. This is going to be, of course, an important release to support. So VCL and FireMonkey will both be well supported on that. Uh, of course, we're going to continue to uh, focus on cross-platform development and with the goal of this uh, seamless single source uh, and native experience uh, integration. And we're really putting a lot of effort into enabling this Internet of Things and gadgets and wearables and the new types of user experiences that uh, developers can build around them. We've expanded the back-end support uh, with EMS and uh, DataSnap, uh, which gives you more server deployment options, and uh, enhancing, of course, developer productivity in the IDE as well. So let me close with this. C++ Builder is continuing to be invested in. The product is doing great. Uh, we're investing in R&D. We're also investing in Clang LLVM. This is the uh, tool chain with which we deliver our mobile solutions and our 64-bit support. And if you come to my uh, C++ 11 uh, talk at 11 a.m. Pacific, which is in just a few hours, I have a nice surprise to share with you in there as well. Um, and, you know, just the takeaway, and I think most of you know this because you're C++ builder developers, it's about not just being C++, but also the power of being able to build applications quickly and robustly with all the uh, supported platforms, but being able to leverage and extend uh, C++ 11 to all these platforms. So we're going to be staying current on Clang LLVM and continuing to build out that support across all of our supported platforms. So let me close by letting you know we've got some special offers for you today. Um, as Code Rage attendees, there's a 10% off coupon. Um, if you uh, download and activate, uh, we have a Nick Hodges book available to you as well. Um, if you purchase, then uh, purchase enterprise or above. We, we are uh, providing rapid SQL, uh, XC6. This is a wonderful tool if you're doing database development and SQL development. Um, we're also providing a, a media converter. This is to help you if you want to take VCL code and uh, port much of it to FireMonkey. Media converter has been a really good tool for that. Bunch of uh, premium styles, not just for FireMonkey, but also VCL. Um, and uh, and FastQ VCL as well, which is a, a VCL, uh, a great uh, VCL uh, decision cube type of, a, of a product. So check out the Red Offer page for more details and terms and conditions. And with that, uh, I think I went a little bit over my half an hour, but I uh, hope that was useful and look forward to seeing you all in my other sessions. We're doing a session on C++11 in a few hours, as well as introductions into enterprise mobility services. And let's take some questions now. Thanks. There was a question about C++11 on Win32, and you told people to come to your C++ language overview session at 10 Yes, please come to that session. Um, 
uh, I'll, I'll say this, we are uh, actively working on it. Um, and uh, so you'll be able to see some of that in action in that uh, next session in two hours. And then Rob asked, there was no mention of data snap in your slides. Is it still being actively developed and maintained? You did talk about EMS. It certainly is. Yeah. No, it absolutely is. Um, and, I, and as I explained uh, in the slide about EMS, comparing it to data snap, they, they serve different purposes. EMS is more of a built-in uh, turnkey solution where we provide those services, whereas data snap is more of an SDK where developers can build their own services. So the um, both have their place. Uh, we certainly have uh, many customers actively using data snap um, as well. So we're going to absolutely continue to maintain it and continue to add new features uh, where it makes sense uh, for data snap. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure about this question from Rob. It's it's and we'll, we may have to follow up, Rob. It's uh, FD metadata traverse data snap as a T data set. I haven't tried XE seven, so Rob, I'll, I'll try uh, using FireMonk uh, uh, FireDAC uh, metadata operations with uh, data snap and see what uh, see what's going on. I will check and get back to you, Rob. It's with everything in the Q&A log, I also have your email address, Rob, and anybody else who needs follow-up questions. Uh, I'm David I at Embarcado.com, so you can always do that. Let's see. Rob also was saying, as a takeaway for you, use of parameters in FireDAC needs more documentation. Trying to pass 16 byte binary GUIDs ought to be easy. It took me about two days to work out system variant correctly okay that's that'd be a good example rob and uh that'd be a really good example to play with the other way i guess is you could convert the guid to a string and then pass the string and then convert the string back to guid uh there are built-in functions for that just as an option but uh yeah sending binary guids uh, would be uh a nice type to support. And then Gregor was mentioning, I think you covered this or maybe a little bit about uh, many of us are iOS developers and Apple made an announcement that on February 1st, uh, they will require 32 and 64 bit in apps that are submitted to the app store, right JT? Yep, uh, of course we are um, have been and are well aware of the requirement and we'll make sure that uh, you can comply with that requirement. Yep. And then uh, Rob asks, can we disable native platform rendering of controls if we need to maybe, for example, specific behavior coded? And you can uh, do whatever you want with FireMonkey and with styles for each platform, right? There's a, there's a platform default behavior, and Jim's going to talk about that uh, behavior services uh, in his MDD talk in just, uh, uh, let's see if I remember correctly. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, basically, um, Jim's the next there talk. is a, a property that you can set, um, either at design time or at runtime that, uh, allows you to select if that platform or if that control will be rendered by, uh, FMX or the platform. So that's essentially how you would disable it or enable it, um, dynamically. Yeah, I'm just typing. Okay, let me do that. Uh, and again, you that, David? cover some of that with. Uh, a little quiet with over there. Sorry, I was muted for a moment while I was typing, so you wouldn't hear all the clicking uh, on the keyboard here. Ah. Um, and Jim's going to cover some of that with behavior services and platform defaults with MDD in the next session at eight o'clock here in the C plus plus track. Okay, there was a question. I think it was Stephen asked why the check for updates doesn't show updates. I think uh, it, it, he was t he was talking about there are updates, then there are hot fixes, right? So, Jake, right. why don't you re-explain again about hot fixes, updates, and, and the process? Yeah, basically, um, that channel uh, is strictly for uh, the update mechanism in which uh, sometimes updates will be delivered in a series of of uh, packages that can be applied to the current installation. 
sometimes uh, updates are require a full uninstall reinstall. This is particularly the case when we've had to make uh, changes that affect the product uh, in a way that can't be uh, done through the update mechanism. So um, over the last few versions, there's been more cases where uh, some of these updates did require a full uninstall reinstall. And in that case, they won't show up in the the new updates or check for updates section because they're not able to be installed through that that specific channel. Same goes for hotfixes. Hotfixes are small um, patch files or source code files that can be applied to existing, um, you know, existing installation. They tend to have specific rules to how you use them. For instance, replace this file or, you know, merge these this source code. Uh, so again, the update mechanism wasn't designed to to support that. It's designed today to support uh, that update mechanism that we talked about initially, where you get a set of packages that can be applied onto the current installation. So um, that is good feedback and is something we can look to make a little more, uh, you know, either support these other uh, types or at least make you aware that these things are available through that mechanism, even if you can't download them and install them through that mechanism. One place to look uh, for that information is on the community site. Um, we do post uh, when these are available. We also post them onto the EDN site as well. Um, so, uh, of course, that doesn't notify you, but those are good places to check uh, regularly for these types of uh, updates when they come out. Yep. And James asked, uh, how do those those of us who are loyal customers on maintenance get the items mentioned uh, as the incentives for having the latest versions? And I put the URL James and others, if you own XZ7, if you have maintenance, just go to HTTP CC for Code Central .com slash MyReg, M-Y-R-E-G, and that will get you all the registered user downloads. So that's, you know, the FastCube, everything else, all of those things are delivered as registered user downloads. So if you're on XZ7, whether it's maintenance or upgrade or new license, uh, you can go always go to Reg User Downloads. It's also a menu item on on EDN two under Downloads, My Registered User Downloads, and it'll take you again to the same place. And I put that URL in the Q and A log. Uh, question by Stephen: uh, When will we uh, be on later versions of Clang for the C plus plus compiler on some of the platforms? Um, so, <clears throat> although Clang 3.5 was recently released, uh, we're working more with the stable branch around 3.3 um, to get to a full C++11 uh, compliance. Uh, the main reason we're a little behind is that um, although Clang um, gets updated uh, fairly regularly, you know, that we, we need to spend more time on uh, stable branches to uh, build a commercial product. So um, that is basically the reason why uh, we, we stick to a version for a little while, uh, get out the, the updates on that version, and then we'll look into uh, merging up into the next version. So I don't have a timeline to share on 3.5, but we're actively working on the 3.3 branch right now. And I guess the other thing, JT, that I've blogged about is that we have made some extensions specifically for Windows 64-bit, right? as well as for connecting. Yeah, to I mean, that's an, an important consideration. Um, we don't just take Clang and, you know, magically everything works. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of um, extensions and uh, changes that we make to Clang uh, to make it work within the C++ Builder environment to provide the development methodology and approach that you all know and love. So, for example, our keywords or our, our extensions for supporting properties and closures and, um, and RTTI and a lot of these things that are not fully supported or even uh, supported at all in the C++ language, these are extensions that we add into Clang. Additionally, um, there's a lot of work that goes on into supporting platforms. So Clang itself is just a front end, LOVM. Yes, it will spit out uh, the appropriate CPU uh, instructions, but there are lots of things that are very platform specific that take additional work uh, and consideration, such as the exception handling uh, support for that platform, or for that matter, things like calling conventions on that platform, and also making sure that our, 
objects are ABI compatible uh, with um, Delphi or object Pascal objects as well. So there's um, a lot of work that goes into um, updating uh, to a Clang, making sure it all works with the VCL and with FireMonkey, uh, and that you still get full C++ support out of it as well. And that's this, you know, kind of a behind the scenes look at what it takes to uh, to bring a new compiler to market, even when you have a pretty complete front end like uh, Clang uh, that we're able to uh, to use. Yes, um, and then uh, Stephen will, as, J as JT mentioned, will will figure out more ways to get. Uh, notifications to you for updates not just updates but also hot fixes and at the same time one thing uh, I, I could suggest there david also is um rss feeds uh against community as you know at least that's one way that you can see when we post information about this um but uh, that doesn't dismiss the fact that I, I agree update the update channel is a great way to get that information one other thing you may have noticed in in more recent versions too is we have a start here page as well um, we've been able to push a lot more content uh, through that page. And so uh, we definitely are adding, uh, and this can be updated at any time in any version, but we're going to be adding some notification information in there as well. So um, right when you open it up, you get into the welcome page, you'll see right there in the Start Here page, if there's notifications about uh, you know new patches or, or hot fixes or updates that are available to you. Yeah, exactly. The Again, the welcome page. Some people might turn it off, but you can periodically open it under a view welcome page to get uh, the news feeds from the from the menu inside of the welcome page. So that's another good way to get it. It pulls the same feeds from blogs and and articles and so on. Yeah. OK, let me just let me just look to see if there's any other again, if you think about other C++ questions, JT's session is uh, is for C++ 11 language, is at 10 o'clock in just two hours. So you can, we'll leave these questions here uh, and also uh, have more time with JT at, at 10 o'clock this morning, uh, Pacific time. And yep. good comments from Stephen. There's one other thing here about more training videos and, and more videos um, and C++ in general. Well, we definitely have stepped that up quite a bit, um, you know, certainly better than it has been in the past in terms of providing um, com comparable samples uh, that you find in Object Pascal to make sure there's C++ equivalents. Um, but yeah, that's definitely uh, something that we're, we're putting more effort into uh, to make sure that the C++ developers know how to use uh, the new features that are presented through the Delphi RTL, VCL, or FMX, but also in using the C++ aspects of the tool chain, you know, for example, the language features. So um, yeah, you should definitely see more activity, um, both in the community site as well as on the app method blog, particularly around C++ uh, examples. And this code range will have more than 40 videos that will go up. And also we have the skill sprints where we cover sometimes C++ only topics or Pascal topics or both. But we can always do more. Again, we're not training in that respect, but we have lots of videos. Uh, uh, this summer, Jim McKeith and I did a six-lesson um, mobile summer school showing mobile development, uh, including data snap, including... Uh, um, uh, you know, mobile sensors and so on. All of that is available. That we did the class in both an Object Pascal, Object Pascal session, as well as a C plus plus session. So search for on YouTube Mobile Summer School 2014, and there's six lessons for C plus uh, plus that are there. And and I'll collect some of that into a blog post. But we can always do more and and. We'll do more. What you can do, Stephen, is if there's specific topics you'd like us to, to cover, uh, just send me an email, david at marketer.com. I love creating short and or longer videos uh, and these courses. Um, so as I have time, I will do it. So thanks for that. And again, david i at embarkado.com, D-A-V-I-D-I. -I. And JT is just john.thomas. So you can get to us at Embarcadero that way. Even easier, I have an alias, JT at Embarcadero. JT at Embarcadero.com. Okay. 
So thank you, JT, and thank you, everyone.